The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer-to-peer. Hey, what's up, guys? This is Bowdy coming at you on Friday, April the 14th. This is a pre-recorded price report. So um, the uh, the big news, perhaps, other than the markets pumping, which was very nice, uh, but the big news was the inflation numbers. So you can see that um, for the first time, the CPI got back down to 5%. And that seems to be a significant number. It's a nice round number, halfway to 10. Uh, but you can see here in the aughts, it was uh, it was also important. Um, and then last time before that was kind of uh, right around 1990. So that was good to see this come down. Unfortunately, we didn't see the core inflation rate come down as well. That actually ticked up by 0.1%. Um, that is, it's, uh, it's the CPI, which is basically everything minus food and energy. So uh, or maybe it's also rents. Um, I think the biggest component here of the core inflation that's causing it to be high is still um, rents, or that's one of the components. And it does look like rents are going to be coming down. Um, it looks like property values um, perhaps could continue some downward trajectory. Although if this market pump continues, maybe that um, maybe that's attenuated some. But at any rate, it does look like we should be seeing rents come down. So you know, hopefully everyone can celebrate and negotiate for a lower uh, a lower rent for their landlord or with their landlord. Um, and then the producer price index is in blue and um, that's already back down to 2.7%. So um, this is good. This this is probably a factor in what helped the markets to continue being positive this week when these numbers came out. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at the Federal Reserve balance sheet. We'll cover the macro stuff and then get to Monero. So um, here's the, you know, the pump, the re-expansion of the balance sheet that happened um, to sort of backstop the banks. And um, these were, again, these were all 90 day loans or less. So the, the most recent downtick was less than, you know, the other two downticks over here. Now, it could be that basically people were taking very short term loans on the order of one to three weeks or taking the full 90 day loans. So it's possible that um, this might continue to sort of come down very slowly. And then um, maybe in about two and a half months, when those 90 day loans start to expire, perhaps we could see this drop even more. But um, nonetheless, I don't expect to see this thing just continue skyrocketing to the top. And um, that, that kind of leads into another um, kind of a thesis that I've had that we'll, we'll get to in just a second. So um, let's go ahead and take a look at the yield curve. The red line down here is the overall inversion. And then um, the white line is the overnight federal funds rate. And then you've got the, uh, the three and six month yields. They're yielding above the federal funds rate and then everything else is yielding below. Now, there's an interesting thing that's happening this time. And this time it's different. And those are dangerous words, but there's a dynamic here with the federal funds reverse repos. And I think what's happening here is that, so we haven't really ever seen the federal, the, the reverse repos um, be this high, like ever in, in its history. And you can see that going back all the way to 2004. So what happens is these reverse repos are money parked with the Fed overnight. They basically get the federal funds rate. I think it's just like a tick below, maybe like 0.1%. And um, so you can imagine that, okay, if you're an institution, you can hold bonds, uh, you can hold treasuries that are yielding down here, the long-term ones are yielding three and a half percent, or I can hold a reverse repo with the Fed, park some money overnight, get the same interest rate basically as the federal funds rate, the overnight rate, um, and then have that cash be completely liquid, right? I think that this is a mechanism that the Fed is using to try and prevent a smashing down of this yield curve. So, or, or really just in general, a, a, a crash in yields overall. So you can notice that basically every other time that we've had big market crashes have been preceded immediately by yields just totally cratering. Um, and you can, you can look back and see that over many, many cases, whether that's the 2008 saga um, or 2001. So I think what's happening here is the Federal Reserve is, they've opened this federal, uh, this uh, reverse repo lending facility um, and they've got the rates so high that it's encouraging players to to put their money with the Fed overnight for a higher interest rate rather than buying these bonds down here. That's significant because when there's a lack of demand for a bond, the interest rate necessarily has to go up. And so I think what could be happening is they're trying to prevent these uh, these longer term uh, longer term yielding bonds. So that the 30 year, the 20 year, the 10 year, they're trying to prevent this from basically just cratering to the downside because that's, that's basically always signals or almost always signals some kind of market crash. And so um, by keeping people wanting to be up here in these bonds, um, these things maybe don't crash as much. It's just a thesis. Maybe that's correct. Maybe it's not. Um, but it also kind of in, um, interrelates with 
uh, another thesis that I've had about the Federal Reserve inflation and intervention and central banks in general. So overall, the idea is that they want to make the minimum interventions necessary to prevent a full-on collapse. And the reason is because with inflation being so high, they can't actually rescue the markets like they could in 2008, 2001, or any of the other times that they've done it. So basically, and, and sort of the evidence for this is going back to September, October, if you remember, I was saying that the only thing that could save the markets was intervention by central banks. And that's exactly what we got. But what did we really get? Was it really that much? I say no. I say it was the only thing that the only real intervention that happened was the UK opened a window where they were buying buns. They call them buns over there. Here we call them bonds where they opened a window to buy buns off of the institutions. And I think it was the same problem that the US banks had recently where um, they had long term low yielding debt as rates were going up. And so but that was a minimal intervention. And so was the recent intervention. Yes, they expanded the balance sheet. Yes, they, they pulled some emergency measures, but they didn't really just go on complete policy shift, QE, lower the interest rates, right? They didn't do the stuff that they've classically done, um, which are very sort of extreme measures. So to me, it looks like they know that they can't rescue the markets. So rather than letting it get to a point where things could get crazy and difficult, they're just gonna rescue the markets um, little by little, tiny bit by tiny bit. Um, so that would also kind of uh, be a point in the favor that we might have more uh, more upside overall and like kind of slow um, progressive upside, which is what we've seen so far for the past few months. So right now I'm starting to play with the idea that this pump could last longer than um, you know than I originally anticipated. Um, but you know that that would be a good thing, right? We get some more gains. So um, with that in mind, let's go ahead and take a look at um, you know let's finish off with these uh, with the reverse repos. We are seeing these tick up. Um, we're basically at a cluster of moving average, uh, sorry, uh, standard deviation lines, which are sitting about right here. Normally, um, this would kind of tend to limit price to this area, price the chart to this area for a while. Um, but this isn't exactly a price chart. Um, it's more, you know, it's the amount of money parked overnight with the Federal Reserve. So um, if this continues to go up, that might not be the best sign for risk assets. So we'll just have to monitor it. Um, you know, we'll see how that goes in real time. The U.S. dollar. Um, let's take a look at the long term on this. <clears throat> so essentially, we've got this rising support line. Um, it was broken down for a while for the uh, for the post 2020 March 2020 event, um, and then but otherwise, you can see that this has been a pretty important line uh, for a while. So it does make a lot of sense. I have been expecting to finally touch this line at some point. I think this would make a lot of sense right here. Um, that would sort of go along with the rest of the market, how everything looks. That doesn't mean that we couldn't potentially have temporary bounces along the way. Um, you can see that you know this kind of important, um, shorter term, but still important line. We're basically like following that down, and then the dotted line you can see goes back to um, all the way back to uh, the uh, 2020, and it's it's just kind of like a natural place to draw that line. Um, but there's you know I mean hypothetically you could put this thing in other places, right? You could put it here, you could put it there. But um, anyways, just kind of like a point of reference, and it does look like the market thinks that was an important spot. So I do think that this area down here is a spot to um, to take a look at, um, to be cognizant of. And on those time frames, it would sort of suggest we have until May, perhaps mid-May or even June, um, for some continued gains in uh, in risk assets. So with that, go, let's go ahead and take a look at Monero. Okay, so Monero finally broke this um, this downsloping, you know, final boss bear market resistance line. Um, it, it hasn't really broken it in the most impressive way. We, we have these wicks up here, and those wicks aren't great. Um, they're not huge wicks, but you know we don't really like to see that. I would have much rather seen this go up a little bit higher. Um, but at the same time, we've got one, two, three, four. If today we close above, and I do believe it's likely we should, um, it's Friday. Uh, that's four days above closed, and uh, we're here. You know, we had basically one, two days, and then it just crashed back down. Um, it's, it's not nearly as bullish as we would like. Um, I mean, it, it is bullish, but it, it doesn't look like the rest of the market uh, bullishness. But it is what it is. And overall, um, you know, I mean, at least we finally broke in this line. And hopefully we can hold it. You can kind of see that there's this, um, maybe we could draw a trend line like right there. Uh, it's, it's possible that we could come down, test this area here, and then, and then bounce off. Monero does seem to have counter cyclical movements. Um, I do think that's intentional. Um, Let's go ahead and take a look at Monero Bitcoin. So we've talked about this before, where uh, where it definitely seems plausible, likely based on past activity, um, even even going all the way back to like 2016, 2015, that the ratio XMR BTC 
when the rest of the market is getting bullish, um, it does seem that we end up in this zone down here. And it's a distortion. This is a zone to me of maximum distortion where they're pumping everything else beyond really what it should be. They're trying to suppress Monero as much as they can. And if we expect that the markets are going to continue to be bullish, and I pretty much do, um, we probably do need uh, the ratio is going to be playing down here. I and mean, that's, that's really just what this chart says. So prepare yourselves, you know, as we say mentally, um, you know, maybe if you've got some shit coins, maybe if you're participating in the, the degeneracy elsewhere, you can roll those gains into Monero. Um, one of the good things we have going for us now is that it looks like an established pattern in people's minds that Monero does well in bear markets, um, that it gains so much versus Bitcoin during the bear market. So uh, we might have that working for us at the top and the reversal of whenever this, uh, you know, this movement and in, in risk on um, ends. We could look at um, Monero versus Ethereum. Um, I'll show you guys these charts one day, all that colorful stuff, but uh, I'm still kind of preparing. Oops. Still kind of preparing some things. They're cool charts. They're really cool charts, and they, they show you a lot of stuff that's very important. Um, and I wish I could show them to you now, but uh, you know, I'll I'll let you know when I can. Okay. So, anyways, um, I posted a tweet just maybe it was on Wednesday or Thursday, where I said that uh, I think it was Wednesday, where I said that it looks like this chart might be about to reverse, and that was kind of based on the Ethereum Bitcoin chart. Um, I tweeted that uh, specifically. I tweeted that. It looks like um, it was kind of like last chance. You know, I said, hey, last chance Ethereum, uh, ETH BTC. If you don't stop and rebound here, um, you, you've basically got air all the way down into about uh, to about the 0 0.5, 0 0.05 area. But um, really, like within hours of me posting that, um, that's exactly what happened. This thing stopped and reversed on a dime and really took off. So the um, a bunch of stakes got unlocked on, um, I think it was Sunday night, Sunday evening. And <clears throat> they... Um, they don't they can't all dump at the same time the most that could be dumped i was reading an article something like one and a half billion maybe is the max that could be dumped but the reality is that it's probably going to be far less than that um and a lot of people are just going to restake um some people are going to sell sure but it does seem like um, this was a buy the rumor sell the news or technically in this case uh sell the rumor buy the news so with this when that thing stopped in reverse there's another important factor happening here and that's the z-scores um, you could very easily say that that is bullish divergence, right? So the ETH BTC chart made technically a slightly lower low with that wick down there, um, but the Z scores definitely rebounded uh, when ETH BTC rebounded. So I say all that to indicate that this chart is, well, let's face it, it's not a great chart right here. Um, there was the opportunity that if ETH was going to break down further, that this chart, you know, XMR versus ETH could have gone to the top side, but Right now, um, with some of the standard deviations I look at, uh, we're, we're looking at probably a 006 area. And of course, you've got this local low down here. So perhaps even 05, 0.05 could happen. So again, I mean, that's just in line with the nature of what happens when um, they find the opportunity to leverage up the markets. So um, I think that's about all for Monero. We're still slightly in positive, um, overall positive shorts versus longs. And um, the divergences, they, they're not, they just don't seem to be giving nearly as much signal as they used to. Um, Qcoin, I'm not sure how much I trust <laughs> any of these numbers anymore, honestly. Um, but we have overall for Binance and for OKX, we have been sort of below the line for most of this week. But um, yeah, I'm not sure how reliable that, that chart is anymore. Uh, but it is interesting to look at. So let's finish off uh, by taking a look at the crypto markets. And um, Bitcoin right now is kind of like, you know, it's the big headline one because People are still worried about the banking system and they're not sure about what's going to happen. So, I mean, right, people are going to go to the big ones that make sense. That's going to be Ethereum and Bitcoin. So we're basically playing in this yellow box here. And that yellow box is a very obvious spot, a very obvious place to draw. We'll go to the weekly so it's even more obvious. Um, it's basically just um, the spot that you would see from the lower bound of the summer crash in 2021 uh, and then sort of the upper bound over here for both um, sort of the close on the weekly and then also um, for June 2022, right? So uh, it's really just a range that I expect us to be playing in for a while. Yes, price is above this sort of line right here, and that's like the highest line that you know, maybe we could draw. Um, but I, I don't really, I don't expect this thing to just bust out to 33,000 or something like that. If it does wick up there, I think that's probably a good opportunity to take profit, um, maybe even worth scalping a short. Um, I don't think that this is over. Like I said, I'm starting to entertain the possibility that uh, that this thing keeps going um, farther than uh, farther than 
you know, than we uh, had originally anticipated. So there's another thing here. This is the BLX chart, which is the lifetime uh, Bitcoin price. And I wanted to do this because these descriptive statistics um, are, they make more sense when we're looking at uh, the full price history. So uh, one thing we can do is just kind of like expand this chart. And you can see that basically the, the moving average which is the white line and then the upper standard deviation, which is the blue lines here. That range there is kind of like the bear market range. Um, and then the purple line is kind of like a bull market. Things are positive range. So we're basically like right on that verge. And these are like, this is psychological in nature, nature. The reason that the standard deviations and moving averages are important is because humans are intuitively, and even animals in general, are statistic, like you can, you can sense statistics in a way, like in a very intuitive way. You might not be able to give the number, but they've just done these experiments where people, um, even when the odds are slightly for them or slightly against them, their body, their bodies will show these like, um, physiological cues that they know the deck is stacked against them. Uh, and it can happen very quickly. So anyways, they're important because they're psychological in nature and in aggregate, the players in the market, um, are going to be going off of sort of like these statistical estimations that everyone's making. Uh, so anyways, we're basically sitting below the um, this purple line, which is like a derivative of the standard deviation. Um, and these purple lines are very important to me. Uh, it's kind of a, a concept that I, I invented. Um, maybe someone else invented it <laughs> probably already. And I just you know thought of it later. Uh, but anyways, this so this is kind of an important resistance point is what I'm trying to get out here. So we'll have to see uh, how that, you know, how this plays out. But I don't expect the, the Bitcoin or um, crypto total charts to be too extravagant, although shit coins seem like they, they want to make a run here. People are starting to get confident, right? We're starting to beat these summer levels. This is total. So, um, you know, and then here on the Z-scores, we've kind of got a positive trend on these Z-scores. So overall, I mean, I, I could definitely see a pullback happening. Um, that's, that's definitely something that we could see. Um, but overall, I do think that it's still game on. I, I You might take some profits, but I mean, Overall, the name of the game so far has just been to stay in the market. And right now, I don't really see anything um, to that would contradict that. So, um, yeah, overall, I think that's that's mostly it. We've got the Bitcoin dominance chart. Um, we've broken above these uh, these statistical levels again, like these kind of a lifetime. Um, this is a lower standard deviation. This orange line here. So um, the thing is, we we hit this uh, we hit this dotted line right here, which is. Um, Kind of a natural kind of one of the final resistance points for btc dominance um i'm not too convinced necessarily that this will have to go up immediately because it does look people like people are rotating into shit coins um and uh you know maybe that's not a bad thing to do to take some trades there um i do think that 52 50 to 52 percent is probably in the cards so um oh and then uh yeah we, oh, we talked about btc so uh yeah that's about it um I say, oh, you know, let's take one quick look at gold and then and then we'll be done. So um, yeah, gold gold has this like it's vas this vacillating price action. Um, and it, I mean it looks like it's gonna keep going up. It looks like it's starting to form this uh, rising wedge. But um, you know, again, I think that gold is a great long-term play. And uh, personally, you know, I would just keep hobbling there. So uh, thanks everyone and I uh, hope you have a good weekend. Yeah, awesome. Right. Thank you, body. I think we have the pre-recorded and also live. The, the best price report <laughs> in the game coming from Body. Oh, Body. Appreciate it, man. Thanks, guys. Of course. No, so, thank you. <laughs> anything you want to add? Given uh, since since you recorded yesterday, is there been any, <laughs> <laughs> any any new new news? No, I don't think so. I saw Monero ticked up. Um, I was worried we might have to go test that line and be nervous, you know, that we could break down again. But it looks like it ticked up this morning, so that's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think of the uh, upcoming Monero birthday Monero run? You think we might see any effect on Monero from that? Um, I, I'm not as optimistic as I was last year on that being like a big price pump event. Um, it, it doesn't seem like there's nearly as much interest. By this time last year, we had already seen significant movement of Monero compared to the rest of the market. Mm. Um, it was also kind of the middle of the bear market, so you know that could it could have a lot to do with that. And then also it does look like Binance um, accumulated a whole big stack of Monero last month. So I think they're probably ready for us this time. Um, maybe it was just too much bad press. So they, they just figured they'd prepare for it because their, their withdrawals have been open like for the past few months. Uh, they've, they've kept their withdrawals open. So, I mean, I don't want to be like a negative Nancy on that. Like I'm still going to, you know, participate by a little bit um, on the 18th and everyone should still do it because we still should audit their reserves. Cause for all we know, 
um, maybe they didn't prepare, right? Maybe that was just all fake. Uh, maybe they're kind of like cooking their books and we, uh, we do the Monero run and, uh, you know, maybe they shut down their withdrawals. So, uh, but, you know, I'm just saying, don't get your hopes too high that we're going to have the kind of crazy breakout like we did last time. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just a good opportunity to pull your Monero off exchanges anyway, if you haven't already. Yeah. Do it. Awesome. I tried to make a Reddit post on cryptocurrency and uh, it oh, didn't get the 2,000 yeah. upvotes like the other one did last year. <laughs> oh, that was you? Okay, yeah, I saw that. Somebody, uh, I, I didn't realize that was your post. It, it didn't get yeah. a didn't get a ton of love. But you kind of you kind of pitched it as let's make this just a general pull your coins off exchanges day, right? Not so much just Monero only, right? Um, I mean, I kind of I kind of tipped my hat to the other coins and to the general circumstances of the market, but it it was Monero focused. It was um, the Monero run or the money run anniversary. So um, I mean, I said you know I mean in general we should be people should be pulling your coins off, and it should be abundantly clear now why that's the case. Um, but, you know, it's kind of a special date for us for Monero because last year we proved that the exchanges were totally fractionally reserved and just didn't have the Monero. They said they did. That was a big turning point, I think, for, for a lot of us when it was like, because, you know, people used to be like, oh, you're a conspiracy, tinfoil hat, whatever. And then we proved it on April 18th last year that, no, they didn't. They couldn't meet our demand. And we're just a small niche group in crypto, um, although it seems like we're becoming less niche um, every, you know, by the month, by the year. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. But it didn't get a lot of love on on Reddit in the crypto. No, this era. the one I posted um, a couple of days ago got maybe like thirty or forty upvotes, but the one I posted last year got like two thousand upvotes. Oh shit! Interesting. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Awesome. I don't know. I talked to JW. You got you got him on your on your show here today. Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll move it along. Thank you so much, man. Enjoy your vacation. Thank you. Yes, enjoy. Thank you for doing the. Uh, if we, if we do a special show on Monero's birthday on the Monero run, maybe maybe you can jump in if you're available. That's coming up right on Tuesday, right? Tuesday. Yeah. yeah. Shit. Okay. Cool. Yeah, if I'm around, I'll definitely try and jump on. All right. Well, enjoy right, your vacation. Thank Cheers. you. Thanks, Cheers. guys. Bye. Later, man. Bye.